and uh, she has served as a star psychologist for two different VA systems. In that work, she provided clinical services in the areas of geriatrics, palliative care, hospice, rehab, neuropsych, post-traumatic stress, and primary mental health and integration. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, your speaker today, Dr. Anne-Marie Kimball. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and Dr. Entwistle is going to help answer questions in the chat box today. So as I am speaking, um, if you have questions that I am not answering or uh, don't get to at the end, which I may not, then please type them in there and Dr. Entwistle will answer those that he has time for and then we'll get back with you with, with responses to those that maybe we don't get to during the presentation. There's a lot of information to cover about cognitive rehab and really an hour is too short, so I'm going to do a little bit of fast talking. Um, but I want to give you a lot of information because this is a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart, to our heart here at Pearson. We have um, a lot of a lot of assessment instruments that are helpful in, in cognitive rehab, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about today, but um, you know, just it's, it's a subject that is, is important and um, one that we wanted to give you some information about. So here's my agenda. Um, thank you for coming today and giving us your time. I'm going to talk a little bit about what cognitive rehab is, why someone might need cognitive rehab, and then the impact of deficits in the areas of attention, memory, executive functioning, visual spatial processing, and visual field. And then briefly about the efficacy of cognitive rehab in the area of stroke and TBI. Um, and then we're going to follow that with another webinar in two weeks, which I'll tell you more about at the end um, with some more information. So first of all, I want to talk about what cognitive rehab is. And in order to do that, we really have to first talk about what cognition is. Cognition is defined as the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. That is a Wikipedia definition, but it's an easy to understand definition. It's not an incorrect definition. It's just kind of a simplistic one. Um, cognition includes the processes of knowing, including attending and remembering and reasoning, and also the content of the processes such as concepts and memories. And that's, that's a little more information from the American Psychological Association. Um, so human cognition is conscious and unconscious, concrete, abstract, and intuitive. Without cognition, we can't use our existing knowledge and generate new knowledge. These are, these are internal mental processes, that, and, they're, and they're processes that we can test with behavioral methods, even though they are not directly observable, all of them. The physical mechanism of cognition really involves two steps, the formation of connections between neurons in the brain, and then the sending and receiving of signals between those connected neurons. Anything, any factor that interferes with these processes creates a barrier to cognition, which is what we refer to as a cognitive deficit. Cognitive deficits can be um, durable, lasting or temporary. Um, some of the durable causes include brain injury such as stroke, TBI or brain tumors, neurological disorders such as MS or epilepsy, congenital defects such as Down syndrome or autism, psychiatric disorders even such as depression or schizophrenia, and then temporary causes may be things like prescription drugs, recreational drugs, alcohol, nutritional deficiencies, and even dehydration. We're really only going to talk about the brain injuries today, just kind of one of these causes, um, but brain injuries caused by things like stroke or TBI. Again, because there's just so much information, it, you know, it's, it's so super elementary to try to cover everything in an hour, so I want to give you a little more information about stroke and TBI. Cognitive deficits usually do affect a or a specific cognitive function or several cognitive functions. About 80% of stroke and TBI victims will have an attention deficit, about 65% will have a memory deficit, and about 75% will have executive function deficits. But attention and memory and executive function really are the most common cognitive deficits no matter the cause of the injury or the trauma. <clears throat> Each of the cognitive functions that I've mentioned is associated with a particular area of the brain, 
that is also kind of a simplistic um, overview, that this is going to be a little bit of a simplistic overview, but for the sake of an overview, um, if you look kind of up on the upper left, let's see if I can get an arrow here. Starting here, we have in the frontal lobe, we have thinking and planning and problem solving, um, decision making. We call those executive functions. This area is also responsible for impulse control, for so for response inhibition. Down below is the temporal lobe, which controls memory, speech, hearing, and facial recognition. At the rear is the occipital lobe, which controls vision and the processing of visual information. The parietal lobe includes uh, perception, classifying objects, spelling, number recognition, visual spatial processing. What you don't see anywhere here is attention, the cognitive function of attention. And the reason is because it's pretty much all over the brain. There's, there are attention areas virtually everywhere in that frontal lobe, the temporal, the parietal lobe, the cerebellum, and even the brainstem. So um, also, you, you, you're looking here at the left side of the brain. It's important to note that the same functional areas that you see here are found in the right hemisphere. They are not just limited to the left side of the brain. It's just difficult to show that. Um, generally speaking, both hemispheres can perform the same cognitive functions, and they usually share the workload. But there is some specialization on particular tasks. There are a lot of diagrams available of the functional area of the brain. This is just an easy to understand one, which is why I use it. But in reality, you know, the brain kind of looks more like, well, not the brain, but the connections in the brain kind of look a little more like this, with each area of the brain talking back and forth with multiple other areas, even to perform a single function. Uh, but this is really, you know, so complex that it's harder to, to talk about it that way. So we stick with the simplified model just in, in discussion. So looking back at the causes of some of the deficits, looking at stroke first, a stroke is defined as the sudden damage or death of brain cells due to the lack of oxygen caused by blockage of blood flow or rupture of an artery to the brain. So two different kinds, Lo um, blockage of blood flow or rupture of, of an artery. So stroke is the leading cause of disability in the U.S. It is the fourth leading cause of death. Again, there's two types of strokes. That first one was the blockage of blood flow, and we call that an ischemic stroke. Depending on the exact location of the blockage, an ischemic stroke can affect a very localized area or a very broad area. If the blockage is in a smaller artery out toward the end of the network, it's only going to affect a very small, very localized area and perhaps only one specific cognitive function. Um, one example might be uh, of a localized ischemic stroke that, that would affect, you know, only the fusiform gyrus and the patient might lose only the ability to recognize faces while other cognitive functions remain intact. But if the blockage is in a larger artery back toward the base of the network, it's going to affect a broader area and that could impact multiple lobes and therefore multiple cognitive functions. About 88% of all strokes are ischemic. The other 12%, roughly 12%, are, are hemorrhagic strokes, and that's when a, an artery ruptures in the brain, and those do tend to affect a broader area. Uh, and so again, it can impact multiple lobes and therefore multiple cognitive functions. Um, so, so usually only an ischemic stroke in a very small artery is going to have a localized effect. Most of the others are more global and may affect more or multiple cognitive functions. The duration of the blood flow interruption determines how severe the cell damage is. You, you hear that you know, people need to get medical attention very quickly after a stroke, and, and that is um, very true because uh, an, an interruption of about more than two minutes is going to cause some cell death, and the cell death is irreversible. A shorter interruption can cause cell damage, which might be reversible. Um, but it's true that pressure from a hemorrhagic stroke that's the, where, where it is bleeding out, that pressure from that blood on neighboring areas can also cause cell damage, um, which also might be reversible. At about, at about 90 days out from a stroke, about 60% still have mild impairment, while almost 20% have severe impairment. At um, about three months, the mortality rate is about 15%. 
But there's one study that's found if you go out about two and a half years, the mortality rate jumps to 54%. So, so basically more than half of patients will die within 30 months of a stroke. And no matter where you live in the world, the major risk factor for stroke is age. With our aging population, especially the aging baby boomers, um, we, we really do expect a significant increase in the numbers. I want to look a little more into how brain trauma affects cognitive function, and, um, and I want you all to do something after the webinar today, and that is to go find this YouTube video by Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. It's called My Stroke of Insight. I don't have time to show it because it's a little longer than 10 minutes, and um, I don't want to give that up in this webinar, but it is a fascinating webinar. Um, she's actually holding a human brain in the in the picture there, which is from her, her video. Jill Bolte-Taylor is a neuroscientist, and in 1996, she suffered a hemorrhagic stroke, and she was aware of what was happening from the um, early, early outset or onset of the stroke. She gives a really fascinating description of her experience. Again, I don't have time to play it, but please watch it if you have a chance to. And pay attention to the things that she talks about, the cognitive functions, because she can name them with her knowledge, and then the problems that she mentions. Um, it, it, it's a really fascinating video. And she talks about, again, it was a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, and, and as I discussed earlier, hemorrhagic strokes tend to be global, and they affect several areas of the brain, so multiple cognitive functions. A broad area ischemic stroke, or a TBI, can produce a similar experience. But Dr. Bolte-Taylor describes some of her experiences, uh, as you can see here. She describes some perceptual changes um, in her body, uh, um, being an outside observer, feeling slowed down, having some euphoria, uh, having an internal dialogue and focus that was going on. She felt like her body was blending with the environment. Um, she had some physical deficits. Of course, her left arm had some paralysis. And then she describes her cognitive deficits. And again, you know, uh, if you have the opportunity to go listen to this, you'll, you'll find it fascinating. Two interesting points. She was 37 when she had the stroke, and she described basically losing her history. So imagine what it would feel like to lose 37 years of emotional history or, or of emotional baggage, maybe. Um, she also describes how it took her eight years to fully recover. She's giving TED Talks. I mean, it's pretty amazing, but it did take her a very long time. When you watch, see if you notice any signs of lingering cognitive deficits. And, and think about how the old school of thought was pretty much that a patient really wouldn't ever recover full function. And also, we hear often that the therapeutic window for cognitive rehab is about two years, and no improvements can be expected after that. But here we have a neuroscientist who told us that her recovery took eight years, and that is really something we need to pay attention to. Part of Dr. Bolte-Taylor's recovery is from restitution, which is the healing of some of the damaged neural pathways, but a large part of her recovery was also due to targeted, repetitive, supported cognitive rehab, which is, of course, what we're kind of focusing on. These are just some of the neuropsychological effects of stroke. Um, Dr. Bolte-Taylor describes some of these. This, this slide is not from her, but these are some of the things that she did describe, weakness or numbness on one side of the body, loss of vision, and inability to see the whole picture, hemianopsia, which I'll talk about toward the uh, middle of this, of this presentation, an inability to formulate or comprehend speech, a loss of balance, loss of consciousness, loss of sensation, um, you know, just a, a number of neuropsychological effects of stroke. So let's look next quickly at TBI, um, traumatic brain injuries, which are defined as the sudden damage or death of brain cells due to a violent blow or jolt to the head or by an object penetrating the skull. TBI is the leading cause of death for anyone under the age of 45. And the damage there is caused by bruising, hemorrhaging, or stretching of brain tissue. Because of the, you know, the types of causes of TBIs, they tend to be global. They tend to affect multiple areas of the brain and multiple cognitive functions. And then there's frequently injury to areas opposite from the area of impact, as you see here on the slide. And this is called a contra-coup injury when the head rockets from its impact to a second impact 
um, or, or the brain actually is, is impacted on the side of the impact and then it smashes up against the skull on the opposite side. In the United States, motor vehicle and pedestrian accidents by far are the leading cause of all TBIs and they account for approximately 50% of such injuries. Falls are the second leading cause. They account for about 20% of all TBIs. They, they do account for a higher rate of um, TBIs in older adults. Gunshots and assaults and sports and recreational accidents are the next most prevalent causes. Um, and then work-related trauma and suicide attempts also account for many TBIs. It's also important to note that about 50% of all people who sustain a TBI were intoxicated at the time of the accident. <clears throat> um, let's see. TBI, as I said, it, it it occurs really with a disturbing frequency among Americans. Um, overall, about a million TBIs are estimated to occur in the United States every year. About every 15 seconds, someone in the U.S. sustains a TBI. Of those, 375,000 are hospitalized, 50,000 result in death, 100,000 sustain moderate to severe brain injuries that result in lifelong disabling conditions. Uh, and that's really only the number that are reported through ER visits. You all know you've seen people who have a head injury, you know, get hit with a softball in a softball game or, or bump their head in a fall who never go get um, attention, medical attention. So many more go unreported and without medical care. About 52,000 people die from TBI each year, and then a significant percentage of survivors will have moderate to severe disabilities. It's estimated that there's a, a little more than 5 million people living in the U.S. today with permanent disabilities as a result of TBI. And of course, the chances of suffering a TBI dramatically increase if there's a history of any prior head injuries. Um, after there's been one TBI, the risk of a second injury is three times greater than for those who have not had a prior TBI. Uh, after a second TBI, the risk of a third injury is eight times greater than for someone who has not had a prior TBI. Some of the common patient symptoms after TBIs are, are these that you see, a decrease in intellectual functioning, slowed processing speed, memory loss and forgetfulness, difficulty with language, emotional changes, changes in insight, attention and concentration changes, and difficulty with planning or multitasking. The, the brain is really responsible for producing all forms of human behavior, and the brain is a pretty fragile organ, and severe injury really can create some significant problems in behavior and adaptive functioning. Um, so after a severe TBI, there's several common long-lasting deficits in functioning that can occur. Um, and, and as you can see, these kind of symptoms really can cause problems in, um, in, in a, with a person having trouble being an effective part of society. Um, trouble with, with family and social relationships and participating fully in community life. Okay, so we understand a little bit about cognitive deficits. What do we do about them? Um, during most of the 20th century, we really thought that brain structure was fixed. It was solidified after, after a critical period in early childhood. And after that period, if you had a brain trauma, it, we assumed pretty much that you'd have to live with the resulting cognitive deficits. But in, the, in more recent years, researchers have shown that the brain's physical structure and functional organization can and does change in adults. This is a concept called neuroplasticity, as you see here on the slide. It's, it's the brain's ability to remold and rewire itself. It's a response to changes in behavior and environment, thinking, or emotion. And it's a key, the key to, um, to this restructuring is repetition, which one of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, okay, yeah, I'm going to move, move on to, here we go. So recovery of cognitive functions can be aided with cognitive rehab therapy, which is defined, one definition is, a therapy program to help cognitively impaired individuals restore normal functioning or to compensate for cognitive deficits. There are specific therapies designed for each of the cognitive functions. We won't dive deep into the specific types of therapies today. Um, Dr. Entwistle will do that in a little more depth in a couple of weeks. We're going to cover it briefly today. Um, but let's talk about ways that cognitive functions are restored in general. One way is restitution. 
that is the reestablishing and strengthening of damaged neural pathways. This is the healing process, basically, and it applies in situations where neurons are damaged but not dead. So this could be from that short-term ischemia or from pressure or, or, I mean, from pressure damage from a hemorrhagic stroke or from the stretching that's caused by TBI. So they're, they're neural pathways that are damaged but not dead, and they can be reestablished and strengthened. The restorative approach really aims at reinforcing and strengthening or restoring impaired skills. So it includes the repeated exercise of standardized cognitive tests of increasing difficulty, targeting specific cognitive domains like selective attention or memory for new information, so, so some pretty specific tasks. The purposes of, of process training is to really stimulate those poorly functioning neurological pathways in the brain in order to maximize their efficiency and effectiveness. It really aims to overcome that damage. And, and those kinds of functional improvements are made over many months or even years, as you will hear when you hear Dr. Balti Taylor talk about her own recovery. Another way is reorganization, and that is developing and strengthening new neural pathways. This is that neuroplastic process which may involve a slight detour to go around a damaged area or a total reassignment of a cognitive function to a completely different area of the brain. In reassignment, the function is often reassigned to the contralateral side of the brain, that is the same area on the opposite side of the damaged area, but not always. And then the third way, another way of recovering cognitive functions is compensation, and that is the use of new strategies or external aids. And the, the most common that we're familiar with there are things like um, memory strategies or external memory aids like notes or day planners. The compensatory approach really teaches ways of bypassing or compensating for the impaired function, the development of new com uh, compensatory skills to enhance daily performance and retained skills and functional reorganization are used to learn new strategies. It's also called strategy training, and it may involve the use of those external kinds of tools like diaries and electronics and adaptive equipment, um, adaptive technologies, calendars, electronic memory devices, alarms, things like that. Those are compensatory techniques. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, these, these three um, the ways that cognitive functions are restored are often undertaken at the same time and should be. Um, treatments that attempt to restore that, lo that lost function really should be undertaken at the same time as you teach compensatory strategies to minimize the cognitive impairments. In terms of practical therapy, there's not a lot of difference between restitution and reorganization in terms of what it looks like. Um, whether the old neural pathways are being repaired or new ones are being built, we're not able to see that happening in the brain, but the results are the same. The neural pathway and the cognitive function are restored, whichever it is. Compensation, on the other hand, of course, is used to deal with existing cognitive deficits without restoring neural function. Um, so, again, part of Dr. Bolte Taylor's recovery is from restitution. That's the healing of the damaged neural pathways. But a large part of her recovery was due to targeted, repetitive, supportive cognitive rehab, um, which can promote and accelerate restitution. So we're going to look at the um, cognitive function areas quickly, and the first one we'll look at is attention, because attention is the core of cognition. It really affects all other cognitive functions. It affects all other cognitive rehab. It affects all areas of ADLs, activities of daily living. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's the most common deficit after stroke and TBI. Um, a, a decent working definition of attention is at the bottom of the slide, the allocation of consciousness resources to perceptual inputs. Um, you, you can find a number of, of definitions, but that one works uh, as a good working definition. Researchers have identified five different components of attention. There's alertness, which includes tonic alertness, the general level of awareness, and phasic alertness, which is the ability to increase that level of awareness after a warning stimulus, um, like when the, when the pre-stimulus says, okay, pay attention now, so when, it, when cued. Selective attention is that ability to focus attention onto a particular stimulus while ignoring other stimuli. Sustained attention or vigilance is, is just like what it sounds like, maintaining attention on a stimulus or task. 
Visual spatial attention is the ability to change the attention focus from one stimulus to another, usually from one location in the visual field to another. And then divided attention is the ability to focus on two or more stimuli at the same time. So normal activities require specific components of attention. And one or more types of attention is necessary for, again, all of the activities that we enjoy. Um, Selective attention provides the filtering required for speech recognition. Therefore, it's necessary for socialization. Focused attention is needed for reading or hobbies. Sustained attention is required for understanding the content and context in movies and televisions and books. Shifting focus is required for crossword puzzles or other hobbies. Divided attention is needed for activities like dancing, which require a response to multiple stimuli. So think about how a disturbance in attention really affects a person's quality of life, the things that, that you may enjoy the most, reading and television and hobbies and socializing. Those things can become so strenuous that a person begins to avoid them when they have deficits in attention. And of course, that lack of healthy activity then has a tremendous impact on physical health. And then of course, research has shown a really strong correlation between attention disturbances and trips and falls and 